of you. <laughs> uh, so it's great to be here. I'm really enjoying BU and, and Boston. Um, I'm here to talk about this. What am I holding? A chunk, yeah, a rock, a chunk of coal. You're going to go to BU for four years and walk out of this great university, and will you have a job? Well, I have jobs for you, and it's all energy related. I don't care what your, I mean, if I could convert all of you into being earth science majors or environmental science majors, oh, I would. But knowing something about energy is a demand that's never going to go away. Political science, international relations, education, law, we need you. You're the English major. Okay, go write the great American novel about life in the, amongst the wind farms. We need you. <laughs> because our population on this planet has already hit the 7 billion mark. The demand for Earth's resources are never going to go away, including energy. When I was your age, when we were your age, <laughs> there were just 3 billion people on this planet. Nearly 4 billion. But now we're hitting 7 billion and we're not going away. Look, energy is all around us. It drives our cars, it drives our buses, it eats and lights up our homes. Where is that energy coming from? Well, it's an interesting cocktail. And I'm going to start with this, all right? Coal, oil, and natural gas are fossil fuels because they came from ancient life that lived and died and lived and died and lived and died and lived and died for millions of years. Life has been on our planet for at least 3.8 billion years, if not older. Life began very early, very early in Earth's existence. But life remained very small in numbers, only in the oceans, in very small amounts, until there was a life explosion. As my students are here have heard me say, a half billion years ago, finally, the Earth is 4.6 billion years in age. Life has been around nearly since the very beginning, but it was never very abundant, and only in the oceans. But finally, in the last half billion years, life just exploded in the oceans. And then finally on land. Coal comes from land plants. Land plants. And so now I've got a half billion years of life. Life getting more and more abundant. Life getting more abundant. And it dies. And it falls down in a swamp. Or it lives in the ocean. It falls down at the bottom of the ocean. And now we're digging it out of the earth. Coal thing about fossil fuels is that there's only so much of them. They are a finite resource. And once they're gone, that's it. All right? That's it. Coal, we unfortunately have lots of coal. And most of the world's coal is in the United States. Followed second by Russia and then third by China. And you know what? We're going at it at, after coal with abandon. We're taking down entire mountainsides. I thought Obama, who I voted for twice, was going to outlaw Mountaintop mine. Uh -uh. Didn't do it. He wanted to get reelected. And he's in a tough political state. Taking down entire mountains. If I dragged in some charcoal into this room and lit it, it's a lot like coal. What would happen in this room to all of you? You'd die. <laughs> carbon dioxide. So car coal is mostly carbon. It is a hydrocarbon, but it's mostly carbon. And when I burn this, when it makes, it's really hard to put out, it's really hot, it's really hot fire, I can run a locomotive on it, but all the, all the exhaust, just like a charcoal, people do drag in charcoal grills in houses sometimes to keep warm, and what happens to them? They die. They die. Carbon dioxide is not only a greenhouse gas, it's a poisonous gas. And it's a lot like oil, oil and a hydrocarbon. Unlike coal, there's not much oil left on this planet. We've been going after oil for over a hundred years. It took a half billion years for all that oil to be made. Half billion years for all that oil to be made. After that life explosion. And now it's halfway gone, almost halfway gone. We keep looking for peak oil. When are we gonna finally start decreasing? Well, we thought we were gonna have peak oil finally start running out in 1975. It didn't happen. Then it was gonna be uh, 1995, and then 2010. The last projection I saw was 2017. Natural gas, in contrast, we may, by some evidence, we may have 40 or 60 years of oil left. 
and then it's eight, about 80% gone. The peak keeps shifting. The thing is, about the economic supply pyramid for the fossil fuels is it's got a very soft bottom. The easy oil and gas and coal is at the top. That's gone. The tougher oil and gas in the middle, all right, we're going through that with abandon. But it's the really deep oil and the entire, and the deep coal uh, that is hard to get out. But we've got the technology. We've got the technology now. It keeps changing. Coal, oil, or foul. But this is natural gas in the form of protane or butane or methane, mostly methane. When I burn natural gas, unlike coal and oil, it's mostly hydrogen. The formula is CH4. It's got four hydrogens. So when, I, when you burn natural gas in your stoves, in your ovens, do you vent it? You might have an exhaust fan for odors. You don't even vent it, all right? Because it's mostly, mostly hydrogen. So that's a very clean fossil fuel. But it is still producing greenhouse gases. And global warming is happening because of our burning all these fossil fuels. So I'm going to first talk about fossil fuels, then talk about nuclear power, then I'm going to talk about green energy. All of this is about jobs and careers for you. Okay, but the demand of which is never going to go away, no matter what field. While you're in college, good old BU, take a course in energy, all right? Today what I'm doing for you is I'm taking three hour and 20 minute lectures down to 10 minutes. <laughs> 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 but it's all, it's all about you. The thing is about natural gas and oil, we can develop new technology to get it out of the ground. We used to leave 50% of it in the ground because we couldn't get it out. You, you know, it's like trying to suck a soda out of an ice cube laden glass and you get down to the last part and you can't get it all out. Well, oil is a lot worse than soda. It's thick and it, it's heavy. And so you leave a lot of it in the ground. But now fracking, we've learned how to go in like with a sidewalk sprayer. We drill down, we come in sideways and we take water and we flush it down and sweep it down where we can suck it out. Whole new technology, of course. What's wrong with it? You're using water. You're using our good water. There's only so much for good, fresh water on the planet, and you're using it up, and the oil companies are going after it, all right? And the states are allowing it. Even New York outlawed it, and then changed their mind, right? Recently, all right, so it's all politics. You know, we need good leaders. Be that person. Uh, global warming, uh, I had a very educated person just two days ago. Says, oh, oh, this global warming. Ah, oh, the earth has always had cycles in its climate. That is a mistruth on truth. All right? Yes, the earth has always had cycles of climate. We have had six ice ages in the last billion years. In Massachusetts, we had one at 600 million years ago. It made the Putting Stone conglomerate. That's the state rock of Massachusetts. Uh, Ken Elmore's home is made out of it. <laughs> there he is. President Bob Brown's home is that these are BU houses made out of that budding stone conglomerate. All right. And we had a second ice age, the Pleistocene ice age. All right. And that was a cycle. In fact, not one. In the last, the Pleistocene ice age, we didn't have a single event. We had as many as 16 events, 16 events, maybe 24, of the Earth. Getting really cold and getting really warm and melting all the ice. And getting really cold and melt. What's going on? We actually don't understand this. Do you want a job? <laughs> <laughs> the truth is we don't understand it. All right? And this has caused some people to be environmentally skeptical. That we don't understand. So what do you mean you don't understand all these cycles? And then don't tell me about global warming. But watch the data. All right? We came out of that the last cycle 10,000 years ago. By 1,000 years, we had warmed up where we are. And the temperature plateaued off. We had a little bitty ice age, another really warm period, and then suddenly, in the last 150 years, the temperature just took off. Now, I don't care whether you're plotting uh, 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 temperature, uh, temp time versus temperature, or time versus methane, greenhouse gas, time versus CO2, greenhouse gas. It takes off like that. We call it the hockey stick plot. <laughs> Today, the warming is happening at a rate that the Earth has never seen before. Wow. So to the scientists, it's no longer a scientific question. 
It's simply a political one. But we've got leaders that ought to be in our earth science classes taking something. We've got the Rick Perrys of the world, from the governor of my home state of Texas, or, or Michelle Bachman, or Sarah Palin, who all thinks it's a hoax. No, it's no hoax. <laughs> it's crazy. Every year, the parts per million of, of carbon dioxide, which is a very small number, very, very small part of our atmosphere, but it's our important greenhouse gas. It's a very small amount. We double it, things are going crazy. Things are going crazy. I mean, today, how can you question global warming? Today, you can drive a boat across the North Pole during the summer times. Wow. Well, it's okay. The oil companies love it. Now they, can, they don't need to go through the Panama Canal. All right? It's a lot cheaper. They can drive between the ice cubes. Wow. <laughs> so nuclear power. Nuclear power just can't be turned off like that. It's here. It's well entrenched. All right? And here we're taking uranium or enriched uranium. And only goes the process of fission, it's a great amount of power. And we saw what happened when the tidal wave hit, hit Japan last year. Six reactors had to be shut down. Nuclear power is here. And for countries that don't have a lot of coal and gas, they, they invested in nuclear power. France, mostly nuclear power. Germany, all right, Lithuania, mostly nuclear power. Israel, so it's here. The trouble with nuclear power is that it's got all this nuclear waste. You can't run uranium down to zero. And it's hot. It's dry. And what do you do with it? So we turn now to the green energy. And it is growing. The green energies have more jobs than all the other industries because they're new. They're sprouting. Now, <laughs> uh, in that, there's a range. Uh, hydroelectric, for example, has been around for a long time. It's not a growth industry. It's a number one. It's number one in terms of producing electricity. But it's no longer, we, we're done building dams. In fact, we're starting to tear them down. Because hydroelectric dams block fish from getting upstream into shallow waters where predators can't follow so they can have their babies safely. And I've watched the Sacramento River in California, I've watched fish, salmon, throw themselves at the walls, doing what was built into their genes to go upstream, and they hit the dam, hit the dam, and they throw themselves at the thing. Crazy. Built in. All right? Nuclear power also blocks sand from getting to our beaches. So today, today we've upset the balance of power. Today we're losing sand beaches all over the world. Ask New Jersey. All right? Every time there's a storm, the sand goes out, but there's no new sand coming down the rivers because we've blocked Because we've blocked all over the world. So today, we need to blow up dams. All right, and turn to other sources of green energy. The growth areas, number one growth is wind. And we need it, it's very labor intensive. Somebody's gotta go way up there. <laughs> Whoa. And, it, and, and when you watch a windmill, don't watch the middle of it, watch the tip. Watch the tip, it's really moving, it's really moving. And inside, inside is a generator. A lot of these use generator. Hydroelectric uses a generator. Wind uses a generator. Okay, a lot of these use a generator. And the generator used to be iron moving across iron, iron magnets moving across magnets, iron magnets. And that makes electrons flow. But now we're making stronger magnets out of not iron, but rare earth elements. Rare earth elements aren't so rare. But we closed our last rare earth mine 30 years ago. And China today dominates the rare earth market. They control, and magnets are huge for all kinds of energy is created with generators. One problem with wind <laughs> is it kills birds. And the students in my classes will remember a movie that I showed of an eagle flying in and out. I said, don't watch it if you, it's gonna get hit. <laughs> and it actually got hit twice. Oh. Oh. And then fell to the ground, still alive, but broken, okay? Solar. Solar doesn't use a generator, but solar, there's different kinds of solar. They're kind of fun. Well, one solar, you just put water up on your roof and it gets hot and then you can use it for your hot tub. But uh, solar panels use silicon or other metals. And as soon as those photons hit, electrons flow, electrons flow. Okay, that's a second kind of solar. A third kind of solar, well, did you ever do this? Did you ever take a magnifying glass out in the sunlight and go chase a doodle bug or some kind of little insect? Yeah! 
and you can blow them up. So another kind, a third kind of solar is using parabolic mirrors, like those magnifying glasses, and then concentrating all that light at water and turning it to steam. Steam expands and runs a generator. Okay, magnets pass magnets. Okay, so solar and winds are number one and number two. Hydroelectric is already there. Biofuel is interesting. Biomass, I mean. Biomass is any kind of biology and you turn it into energy. So that biology might be corn. And from that we'll make alcohol and either drink it or fuel our cars. <laughs> uh, it works. Okay, biomass. Uh, another kind of biomass that happens right here in Massachusetts at the Deer Island Sewage Plant. What a great place to go. Deer Island. My, my students hike it with me. It's three miles around. It's flat. You got the ocean view all the way around. Deer Island processes all of Boston's sewage and half of Massachusetts. I love sewage. All right? <laughs> <laughs> and they take all our sewage, flush, 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 it goes underneath Commonwealth <laughs> Avenue, all the way up past the airport, it goes out to Deer Island, where they break it down into three products. The sludge, the solid stuff, gets piped over to Quincy, where it's used for organic fertilizer. Cool. The gas they capture, methane gas, these big domes, they capture. This methane's not a fossil fuel. You're not a fossil, and it's coming from your toilets. <laughs> yeah, biomass, I love it. <laughs> the third, liquid waste, they pipe way out in the ocean. So there it goes to feed the fish. So, you know, energy, energy, it's happening, all right? Um, geothermal. That's where you take water, you get hot water from deep in the ground. And you go down deep enough, it might make, turn into steam, and you've got steam. So you go down to cold water down to where it's so hot. Iceland is all about this. Iceland is 100% green energy. Norway is 95% green energy. They don't have any coal and oil. And so Iceland is hydroelectric and geothermal, sending water down into hot rocks where it's converted to steam. And that expansion then runs a generator. And we use really strong magnets in it. Okay, cool stuff. So all, all over the world. But did you know that BU has a geothermal building? Yeah, they do. <laughs> right on Commonwealth is where, where the bottom floor is, is the Upper Crust Restaurant. Upper Crust, it says. Okay. That's it. They have six wells. They don't make steam. But they send six wells down 1,500 feet where the temperature is a constant 55 degrees, which can cool the building during the summer and warm the building to a certain degree during the winter. Is that so cool or what? <laughs> BU is way out there. <laughs> uh, I think I'm probably, you know, I, I, I made notes too. I made notes real fast before I came over, put on a little piece of paper like that and left it. <laughs> Accidentally. <laughs> Who am I leaving? So, and then hydrogen. Hydrogen. There is there a future? Hydrogen is great. If you take hydrogen and react it with oxygen, you make water. And it's an exothermic reaction. I remember doing this when I was in high school. I once looked like y'all. <laughs> and I blew up the lab. <laughs> but today we call this a fuel cell. And our cars are already been made that have a hydrogen tank and an oxygen tank. And they go into the fuel cell and they make power. And then lastly, it's just pure hydrogen. We don't know how to do this yet, but it's the future of the world. Hydrogen is the fuel of stars. We can make a hydrogen bomb from it, or we can run a planet. Hydrogen plus hydrogen, not hydrogen plus oxygen. Hydrogen plus hydrogen is fusion. And that releases four times the energy of a nuclear power bomb. Okay? It's amazing. We, st we need a million degrees to do it. <clears throat> so go out there and get a PhD on cold fusion. Okay? And so it, this, it's a changing world. Energy is out there. The markets are shifting from economics to finance to business to law to political science, to international relations. The history of humankind's history of humans has always been about resources. And now I'm telling you the number prime target is energy. 
When I was your age, there was a movie called The Graduate where Dustin Hoffman would played a young college new graduate at the graduate, and an old guy who looked a lot like me at that time was leaning over him saying, I got one word for you. Plastic, plastic. And now my one word, plastic today is bad. Plastic today, we don't want anymore. Take your use your reusable bags. All right, it's getting into our streams, into our oceans, and it's killing our turtles. Plastic, let's leave it alone. Energy. Thank you very much for coming. It's been a pleasure.